Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yareeb Deming with Inside the Outdoors. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our second episode of Backyard Missions. And I want to make sure and recap some of the things that we learned in the last episode, where we learned about some of the birds with my friend Caitlin. And these backyard missions were created by Inside the Outdoors, so you and your family can get outside and observe some of the awesome phenomena that you might see, whether it's birds, rocks. And for today's episode, it's gonna be really special because we're gonna talk about stars. And we have a very, very special guest today, and he's gonna share some of the things that he does when he learns and studies stars, planets. And that is our friend, Scott Mitchell, who is the director of the OCC Planetarium, Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa. So, Scott, go ahead and say hello to our friends in Anaheim Elementary School District. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Now, Scott, before we get into the presentation, the awesome presentation that you're going to be doing for all the students today, I wanted to ask you some questions about your career, your job, and how you got to the place that you are today. Um, because I know there's going to be a lot of discussion, a lot of work that the students are doing on what they're going to do after high school whether what the choices that they're making in college, some of the goals that they're setting. So my first question to you is, first of all, if you can think back to when you were an elementary student yourself, did you picture yourself being in the job that you are doing today? Uh, I don't think, not in elementary school. Uh, I for sure, you know, I was really into, you know, science fiction stuff. I loved, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek. Uh, but I think for most of elementary school, I thought I was going to be a firefighter and then a race car driver. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it wasn't until probably high school that I really started getting into uh, astronomy specifically. Okay. And was there anything in particular that made you choose the career in high school or that path? Uh, again, it was mostly at the time that I just really liked science. Uh, I took a, a physics class that I really liked in high school. Uh, and then, you know, watching, you know, Star Trek, and I wanted nothing more than to be, you know, the captain of a starship. And so, you know, obviously that can't really happen. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to try and do what I could to, you know, contribute to, you know, the field to make it so that someday somebody could be the captain of a starship. Very cool, Scott. Um, and, you know, being the director of a planetary, you know, that sounds like such a fascinating job. Um, can you describe maybe a typical day of what, what does that look like to be a director of a planetary? Yeah, so the, there's kind of the, the director part, which is just a fancy way of saying you're in charge and you have to do a lot of paperwork, uh, you know, all the scheduling and stuff. Uh, that's, the, that's the boring part of my job, but the part that actually gets me through it that you know, makes me want to keep coming back to work every day uh, is the, you know, the planetarium part, the, the astronomy, because we get to do you know, all of these you know, field trips. Uh, we get schools from all over Orange County that come to visit us. Uh, and we put on star shows. We put everybody in the dome. We turn the lights out. We bring the stars on. And I just get to talk about you know, my favorite thing, which is space. Uh, we've got all of these really cool toys that I get to play with. Everybody uh, else on uh, on campus at Orange Coast College is jealous because I just have all of these neat things to to play with. Uh, and it's it's so much fun uh, doing it and seeing you know, all of the the people come in and you know just getting to talk to them. I bet. Sounds like a very, you know, sounds like a really, there are a specific part of that day that's your favorite part? Oh, yeah. So when uh, we're doing a, a planetarium show, we get everybody into the dome, we bring the lights down, and the stars come on. And if you do it just right, you get this 
you know, the oohs and ahs come out of the uh, the audience, and it's really dark, so you can't see it, but I always have this just giant stupid grin on my face. Just that feeling when everyone goes, wow, when the stars come on. That's the best part of my day. That that sounds that sounds amazing, Scott. Now, for all of our friends in Anaheim Elementary School District that are joining us, if somebody was interested in maybe pursuing that path of astronomy, mm -hmm. um, you know, learning more about the planets and stars, can you share with us what was that path? What did that path look like for you after high school? So, so what, yeah, college, you know, classes, things like that. Yeah, so I, I kind of I set myself up to uh, to go into physics in college. I took you know AP physics in high school, uh, so I got some credits for that. Uh, and then when I started at the University of Maine, uh, you know I was a, a physics major. I took you know uh, tons and tons of different uh, you know science classes, uh, and then electives into astronomy. We didn't have a an astronomy major. Uh, so I was a physics major with a minor in astronomy. So I got to choose all of these astronomy classes uh, that I, I got to take. Yeah, I, they weren't required or anything, but I was just really interested uh, in them. And then, you know, it helped that I got a, a part-time job working at the little tiny planetarium that we had on campus uh, my sophomore year. And that's what really, you know, set me on the path from just, you know, in general say, I want to, you know, work in astronomy to I want to work in a planetarium. Perfect, thank you. And are there any specific classes that actually can help you prepare for a career in astronomy? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, in in college, you definitely have to take all of the the physics and astronomy that you can. Uh, but even earlier than that, you know, in elementary, middle, and high school, uh, if you take lots of science classes and math, math is so important uh, for physics. Uh, if you think you know, that the math that you're doing right now is tough, uh, you know, you probably haven't seen calculus yet. Um, so getting you know, as much exposure to math as possible, uh, practicing uh, will really, really help you out in the long run. And you know, speaking about classes, whether in high school or college, um, what were some of your favorite classes? I loved uh, my astronomy classes. Uh, and just science in general. That was always my favorite subject in school, uh, no matter what we were doing, if we were doing you know, physical science or chemistry, biology, I was so interested in all of those things. Uh, and then you know, a part of me, I also really liked history, which kind of shows up in what I do now uh, because it, uh, you can talk about you know, astronomy and the planets and the stars, but I also really like talking about the history of space exploration. You know, the, the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs that sent people to the moon. I could talk all day about, you know, the Apollo program. Uh, I just think it's so interesting. Um, so. That, that does sound interesting, Scott. And, you know, thinking about a lot of the news that's been happening recently with rockets being launched, um, you know, for your career, are there a lot of things that might be changing where you need to keep learning yourself? Absolutely. There's you know new discoveries that are happening all the time. Uh, just I think it was last month uh, they announced that they found chemicals in the atmosphere of Venus that might indicate that there was is life on you know, the planet Venus. This horrible, horrible place where it's you know hundreds and hundreds of degrees. You can melt lead on the surface. It rains acid. And we said, well, okay, there's no possible way there's life there. And then we find you know these chemical traces that say. Well, maybe there is. Maybe we don't know as much about how life works as we thought we did. Uh, and then, you know, in you know the really, really kind of heavy astrophysics stuff with black holes and dark matter, there's a ton that we don't know, and we're learning more about it all the time. Uh, and so, you know, the the shows that we do in the planetarium about things like dark matter, you know, I have to say several times during the program, you know, we don't know why this happens, or we don't know, we're still trying to learn. Uh, and it might take us a long time uh, to you know, figure out how things like dark matter and dark energy work. And then of course, there's all of the you know, constant developments with uh, human space travel. Uh, I watched on was it last Wednesday, the SpaceX Starship test, and that was insane. That was one of the coolest things I had ever seen. Uh, I, I just wouldn't, stop talking about it to anybody that would listen. 
so I love you know just rockets and you know the SpaceX program, NASA's putting together the new space launch system that hopefully will go up soon. Uh, you know the Mars rover they launched back in I think it was in May uh, will land on Mars in February, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, all kinds of you know new things that it's going to teach us, as well as all the stuff that we learned just with big telescopes uh, here on Earth. That, that's awesome, Scott. And your excitement right now is just getting me excited about you know learning more about the stars and just what's coming up. So, you know, this is the last question that I wanted to ask you. You know, for all the students that we have watching us right now and that will watch us later, do you have any tips on how we can be better observers? You know, of the stars, of the planets, from our own neighborhoods, from our own backyards. You know, what can we do at home? to keep us interested in what's happening up above. Yeah, it's it's really hard around here in you know Southern California. We have these huge cities with all of these lights uh, that really kind of drown out the stars. So it, the, the program that we'll uh, be looking at here in a second is gonna show way more stars than you would be able to see from you know, your, you know, your home in Anaheim. Um, but there are definitely things you can see. Uh, you know, the moon is really interesting to see. You can you know, track its phases as it changes, as it orbits around the Earth. Uh, the planets are really bright. We've got three very bright planets that are up right now that you can see. Uh, you, know, you don't need a telescope or anything like that to see those. Uh, but if you wanted to get a, a telescope, a small telescope would be able to you know, show you craters on the moon. You could see Jupiter's moons. You can see all kinds of really cool things. And you don't need a, a you know, large, expensive telescope for that. Um, but if, if you can get away from the city, uh, you know, just you know, maybe a half an hour out to a, a, a dark spot, then you can see tons and tons of stars. Uh, the, I went camping this summer, and it was the first time I'd been in like a nice dark environment in months. And it just blew me away how many stars you could see. Um, but just going out and you know trying to identify the things that you can see, uh, we'll point out a handful of uh, constellations and star patterns that uh, you should be able to see and hopefully you can recognize. And then if you go out and you try and find them every night or every other night, then you get a sense of you know where things are. You see the repeating patterns come back every year. Uh, and you kind of develop a, a relationship with the sky and it you know, can help you, you know, to learn, it you know, definitely inspire your, your curiosity to learn more about the things that you see. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not hard to do because it's you know, directly above your head all the time. As long as it's not cloudy, all you have to do is go outside and you can see something. And, and what are your, Scott, what are your thoughts about the, the apps that you can get on phones or tablets um, I know that I've used them, because, like you said, you know, the lights can kind of hide a lot of the things up in the sky, but something that you could just point your phone up and in the sky and see what's above you, is that something that's useful? Absolutely. There are a ton of you know, really, really good apps like that now that you just you know, hold it up and it tracks around and uh, tells you exactly what you're looking at. Um, the the app that we're going to use here in a second uh, is called Stellarium. Uh, I think the the phone app costs like a couple of bucks, but the uh, the desktop app. So if you're on a, a laptop or a desktop computer, this is totally free, and you can download it and use it uh, on your computer. Um, there's another one that I use uh, called the ISS Tracker. Uh, it's the International Space Station, and it sends me an alert anytime the space station is flying overhead. And you can go out and see it. It just looks like this tiny little star that's moving across the sky. And then it doesn't like go behind anything. It just kind of disappears as it goes into the Earth's shadow. Uh, and so it's really, really cool. It happens, you know, uh, you know, every other week or so, the, the ISS does a, a good flyby. And you can go out and, and see it and wave to all the astronauts hanging out up there. <laughs> that, that's awesome, Scott. Now, we're going to get into your presentation. And, you know, we have some students watching us. And I know they're going to be watching us you know, in the future too, with this recording, um, they're gonna be able to ask questions, which, which is fantastic. I know Mrs. Brown is managing the chat and taking a look at some of the student questions. Uh, so for the students that are watching today, right now, I just wanna make sure that uh, we're responsible with our questions, understand that you're only able to ask one question every 30 seconds, so make it count, make it a good question, because right now we have somebody that's really knowledgeable, you know, with this discussion on the stars. Uh, so Scott, if you can do, you know, the pleasure of 
presenting uh, the, your program, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. All right, so we'll sit, switch over to Stellarium here. So this is set up to show the sky uh, right now. So obviously it's you know daylight. You can see uh, the sun's there, nice blue sky, not too terribly much uh, interesting to look at. So we, of course, want to wait for nighttime. So I've got a little fast forward button here and we'll see the sun go down over there. There we are. So now we're set at, let's see, what time is it now? So it's just after six o'clock is what we've got our, uh, our sky set for uh, right now. And already you can see uh, there's tons of stars. Some of them are, are labeled with the, the stars names if they're bright enough. We've got, let's see, there's the moon which is just a little crescent. If you zoom in, we can see yep, the sliver crescent of the moon. The moon's phases change uh, over the course of a month because that's about how long it takes for the moon to orbit around the Earth. And the moon isn't giving off any of its own light. It's just reflecting light from the sun. And so you can see part of the moon is facing you know, the side that we see here. Uh, part of it is lit up and part of it is dark because you know, we can't see the the dark side of the moon because the sun's light isn't hitting it. Now there's three planets that uh, we'll be able to see in the sky tonight. The first one is gonna be almost straight overhead right here. This is the red planet Mars. And when you look at it in the sky, you will be able to notice that it is a different color from all of the other things around it. It really has kind of a, an orange tinge to it, uh, and it's going to be very, very bright. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't be able to see it like this unless you had a, a very powerful telescope, but there's Mars. Mars has a, a couple of moons that you can actually see here. This is Phobos and Deimos. Uh, these are tiny little kind of potato-shaped asteroid-sized moons uh, that orbit around Mars. So Earth is actually the only planet in the solar system that has one moon. There's two planets that don't have any moons at all. Mars has two. And then all of the other planets, the giant planets, have dozens uh, of moons. But ours is pretty good. Ours is actually the largest in comparison to the size of the planet. So the moon is fairly close in size to the Earth when you compare it to you know, Jupiter versus its biggest, uh, biggest moons. And then you may have heard uh, about this if you're you know, on the news or something. We have a, a special event coming up on Monday. So down here, we've got these kind of two bright lights that are real close together. These are the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Now they are in the process of kind of moving closer to each other as we see them in the sky. And so if we pause here, and we bring up our little thing and we go forward to Monday. On Monday, the 21st of December, uh, Saturn and Jupiter do what we call a conjunction where they line up uh, in the sky and they reach their closest point uh, to each other. And so the in the sky, you'll see them kind of overlap one another. You'll only see one bright light uh, that is both of these planets very, very, very close together in the sky. Uh, and so through a, a telescope or even a, a pair of binoculars, you might be able to make out some of the details. Uh, you should be able to see Jupiter's moon. So you've got uh, three of them visible uh, Monday night. Here's Europa, Io, Callisto. Uh, Ganymede, I think, is right in front of Jupiter. If you can see that, yeah, this is Ganymede, the largest moon in the entire solar system. Uh, so Ganymede is actually larger than the planet Mercury. And Saturn, of course, is going to be right over here with its beautiful ring system, the biggest and brightest of any of the planets. Uh, all of the gas giant planets, so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all of them have rings, uh, but they're all very, very faint. Uranus has, uh, it's kind of our second brightest, uh, but not even close to uh, how beautiful uh, Saturn's rings are. And you can see some of the other dots around here, Rhea, Mimas. These are uh, Saturn's moons. Both Saturn and Jupiter have over 70. Uh, so lots and lots of moons flying around them. Now I'll mention that you know, while they're going to look 
like they're very close together in the sky. They're kind of lined up. They're not really close to each other in space. They're separated by billions of miles. You know, the, because Saturn is kind of coming in behind Jupiter and then it'll pass by. So they just kind of line up. They're not actually close. They aren't going to hit each other or anything like that. Uh, but this event, this conjunction is uh, a fairly rare occurrence, especially one this close where the two objects are going to kind of blur together to look like they're one single light in the sky. Uh, so yeah, those are, are three of the planets that you'll be able to see tonight. They're very, very bright, and you you can't miss them. Um, so the the moon, where did the moon go? Yeah, so the moon is going to be just about due south around, we say, 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be low down here on the southwest horizon. And then Mars is just about directly overhead. So definitely be on the lookout for those three planets, especially with the conjunction on Monday, just so you can tell everybody uh, that you've seen it. Uh, and if you are worried about, oh, well, what if I can't find it in time on, on Monday night? If you go out tonight, remember, so we fast forward in a couple of days. Let's go back to today's the 18th, right? Uh, so they're still going to be right there. Uh, so you have a chance to like go, go out and, and practice finding them in the sky. Uh, and you know, tonight and tomorrow, they should still look like they're two separate little dots. Jupiter is going to be the brighter of the two because it's closer and it's also a little bit bigger than Saturn. Um, but if you find those two bright lights down near the horizon in the southwest just after sunset, then you'll kind of know uh, at least what direction to look. And you are going to want to do this basically as soon as it gets dark enough to, uh, to see because... It only takes a little while for them to set. So they've set now. This is at yep, 7 o'clock. So they're only going to be up for an hour. So make sure you go out and see them while they're still high enough. Too far. All right. So those are our planets. And, of course, there are lots of other things to look at in the sky, the stars. Now, the planets look a lot like stars. In fact, the word planet comes from a Greek word, which means wanderer, because the ancient Greeks thought that they were wandering stars because the planets kind of move around in strange patterns and loops um, as they, uh, they orbit around the sun. The stars kind of stay fixed uh, where they are. So they're always in the same patterns when they come back year after year that we recognize as constellations. Now, there's a handful of very bright constellations that I'm sure most of you have actually heard of before. Let's forward a little bit. There we go. So right here in the middle of the screen is one of the brightest and easiest to spot constellations called Orion the Hunter. You can find Orion easiest by looking for these three bright stars that are in a nice straight line. That's Orion's belt. Once you've found the belt, you go up to his shoulders. You've got a very bright star called Betelgeuse here. Betelgeuse is a red giant star. It's a massive, massive star, hundreds and hundreds of times bigger than the sun. Uh, and it's got kind of a, a reddish color. So it looks almost a little bit like Mars. Uh, it's red because it's a little bit cooler than the sun. Uh, the color of the star kind of tells us what its temperature is. Uh, very, very hot stars tend to be white or even bluish. And then medium temperature stars like the sun are yellow. And then as you cool off, you get into orange. And then red stars are typically the coolest ones. So Betelgeuse is a red giant, which means that it's nearing the end of its life cycle. So stars, you know, just like any living thing, go through cycles where they form out of a big cloud of gas and dust. And then they you know, slowly grow and they burn their... Uh, hydrogen fuel to create light and then towards the end of their lives they kind of swell up and turn into red giants and then the really really big stars will go supernova and they'll explode uh, and they throw all of their material out which makes a new cloud where new stars can be born. Betelgeuse is is nearing the end of its life cycle and sometime in the next approximately 10,000 years that star is going to go supernova. Uh, we don't know exactly when it is because you know, it's so far away and stars live for you know, billions of years. So it's, it's hard to nail down exactly when it'll happen. But eventually, that star will go supernova. 
And when it does, it is going to be so bright that you'll be able to see it even during the middle of the day. Uh, it'll outshine the full moon. And so when that happens, be it, you know, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen 10,000 years from now, but when it does happen, it is going to be a very, very big deal. You'll be able to see it and it'll be super, super bright. Uh, and personally, I, I can't wait for it to happen. I hope it happens tomorrow. Uh, just because that'd be, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to see a supernova like that. Uh, so Betelgeuse is the, uh, the shoulder of Orion. Bellatrix is the other shoulder over here. His head is this kind of little cluster of stars there. And he's got a shield he's holding out in front of him, this kind of curved set of stars. He's got a club that's really faint. These, most of these stars are hard to see. He holds up above his head with a club and then his legs from his belt, you go down to this bright star here. And then this one, Rigel, is the brightest star in uh, Betelgeuse. And it's kind of the opposite of, or it's the brightest star in Orion. And it's the opposite of Betelgeuse. Rigel is a very, very hot uh, blue-white star. Uh, so it shines very, very brightly and it'll look you know, white, if not a little bit bluish. And then here in the middle, just hanging off of Orion's belt is his sword. And if we zoom in on it, you can see that it's got this big fuzzy pink cloud around it. This is the Great Orion Nebula. Uh, it's a huge, huge cloud of gas and dust, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of times bigger than our whole solar system. And these are kind of star nurseries where stars are being born. Gravity kind of pulls all of the material together and squeezes it down until you get the hydrogen gas that exists in this clouds are squeezed so tight that they fuse together in and become helium. And this is a nuclear fusion reaction. The same things that happen in you know, atomic bombs. Uh, these are enormous sources of energy and that's what causes a star to you know, burst to life. Uh, stars aren't on fire, they're not you know, burning you know, like oxygen or wood or coal uh, or anything. Actually, people before we knew a lot about stars thought that they were burning coal uh, until they figured out, no, 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 this is way too bright and way too hot. It has to be something else. Um, yeah, they're, they're not really burning anything. They're doing nuclear fusion, you know, a billion hydrogen bombs every single second for billions of years. Uh, and that's why these stars have so much energy to put out and uh, you know, light up our, uh, our sky. So the, the stars in Orion kind of make this pattern that we recognize as the hunter. And if you have a particularly good imagination, you might be able to see the character there with his club. And uh, in this depiction, he's holding a lion pelt there. So the, you know, because we've got, you know, such you know, light polluted skies here, you're definitely not going to be able to see all of these stars. But if you want to see Orion, definitely be on the lookout for the bright ones, Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, the three in the belt, and then Rigel down here. Maybe you can see this one. Uh, but that hey, pattern... hey, Scott, can, can I jump in for a second, Scott? There was a question that I saw in the chat, um, and it's fascinating because I, I was thinking to myself, how, did this, how are they getting their names? So when you think Betelgeuse for the stars, how are they getting their names? Yeah, the, the names for most of these stars are ancient. Uh, a lot of them come from uh, Arabic and uh, you know, going all the way back to like ancient Babylon and Greece. Um, the, the word Betelgeuse, I think, don't quote me on this, is I want to say it's Arabic or uh, like Babylonian for uh, armpit of the great one because it's in there in the armpit of Orion. Uh, yeah, you, so you'll see a lot of the stars, uh, so if we, uh, if you can read the text, uh, but the two of the ones here in the belt, Alnaham and Alnatak, they start with A-L. Those are how you know that their names come from Arabic, and there's tons and tons of stars that start with A-L. Uh, so Alhina over here, this is uh, Gemini. Uh, we can talk about uh, Gemini uh, has this bright star Alhina, another one that comes from Arabic. Uh, Gemini is the constellation of the twins, and if you kind of turn your head sideways, you can see they look like two stick figures holding hands. Um, the two bright stars in Gemini are Castor and Pollux. Those two come from Greek. Uh, they were two uh, 
uh, brothers, uh, technically half brothers, uh, who um, one was uh, a demigod and the other one was mortal. And when the the mortal brother died, the the one who was part divine went to Zeus and said, "You know, I'm very very sad that my brother has died. Can you please do something?" And so Zeus put both of them up in the sky uh, to to be a constellation. Uh, most of the the characters and stories that we use today for the constellations come from uh, the Greeks and the Romans, uh, but a lot of the, most of the star names are Arabic. So that's Gemini and Orion. Right in front of Orion, we have kind of a, it's easier if I zoom out a little bit. You see this bright star here called Aldebaran. Aldebaran is another red giant star like Betelgeuse, very bright, and it's going to be the angry red eye of Taurus the bull. Taurus has kind of a V-shaped face here, and then his horns stick way up to this star here and to this star here. And so if we click on him, he should light up there. And so Taurus is battling with Orion. Orion's got his shield out and his club raised up above his head so that he can fight Taurus, who of course has these gigantic, uh, very dangerous horns. So he has to be very, very careful to battle against Taurus. Now in Taurus right here, we have another star cluster called the Pleiades. And the Pleiades is one of my favorite uh, things in the sky because you have all of these very, very bright, blue white stars and hopefully you can see through the video that they have this kind of blue tinge to them and they've got all these wispy clouds these are all brand new like baby stars only a couple million years old and what we're seeing these wispy clouds are what's left over of the nebula that they were born out of uh, so over time they'll probably gradually spread apart uh, into space and use up the rest of the material and as the stars move away from the gas you know, the light bouncing off of it won't be as intense and it'll fade out but uh, right now it's uh, one of the coolest things to look at uh, if you have a, a powerful telescope. And Yuri go ahead and, and interject if there's more questions too. keep them coming. Here I can ask a few. Sorry, I was waiting for a pause in the conversation. You're looking at a lot of different stars that are there, and Armando wants to know about how many stars there are in the sky that we can see. So that is a very good question, and it depends on, of course, you know, the the light pollution in your area. Um, you know, around here, you know, in Orange County, you can probably see, you know maybe a uh, hundred if you're really, really looking. Uh, but if you, you know, go anywhere where it's even just a little bit darker than this, then they just start to come out. And if you're in a really nice dark place, uh, you know, like if you go camping, there's millions and millions of stars that you can just see with your eyes. Uh, and if you have a, a powerful telescope, of course, you can see even more than that. There are some, you know, trillion, trillion, billion stars in the universe. Uh, and you know, we can only see the ones that are either really bright or really close to us. So the universe is absolutely filled with stars all over the place. So Aaliyah um, is asking that in our area where we are, what would you consider the most well-known star that we can see from um, our homes if there's not a lot of light pollution? The most well-known individual star might be Betelgeuse. It might also be Sirius, which should be right along here. If we fast forward another couple hours, there's Sirius. So Sirius is this star right here. It's the brightest in the constellation Canis Major, which is the big dog. It's Orion's uh, hunting dog. And Sirius is actually the brightest star in the nighttime sky. Uh, so the only star in the sky that's brighter than Sirius is the sun. Uh, and it's uh, a relatively nearby star. It's only about eight light years away. Uh, and it's uh, another blue-white star, kind of like Rigel uh, in Orion. Uh, very, very, very bright. Uh, so that's probably, uh, it's definitely the, the brightest one, easy to see. But in general, the most famous star is probably the North Star, Polaris. But Polaris isn't very bright. A lot of people kind of have the, the idea that, oh, the North Star is the brightest one in the sky and it's really easy to find so you can find where North is. And it's really not. It's something like, I want to say the 50th brightest star in the sky. Uh, and it's really not very bright at all. And it can be hard to find if you don't know what you're looking for. 
Um, this is it right here. That's Polaris. And it is the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper. So if we turn on the Dipper here, all of these stars are very, very dim and hard to see. Uh, these two at the front of the cup are the brightest uh, plus Polaris here, but the ones in the middle, uh, you're going to have a, a real rough time trying to find them. Uh, the easiest way to find Polaris is to use the Big Dipper. And unfortunately, right now, this time of year, the Big Dipper is below the horizon. Uh, it's actually just down here. So if we fast forward time a little bit more, we can see the Big Dipper come up. And if you watch, all of the stars are kind of moving in circles except for Polaris. Polaris stays right there where it is all the time because it's directly above the north pole of the Earth. So as the Earth spins around like it does every 24 hours, that star stays right where it is and everything else kind of traces big circles around it. And so that makes it very, very useful for navigation, uh, you know, sailors and explorers for you know, the entirety of human history have noticed, hey, this is the only one that doesn't move, and it tells us what direction north is. So you can use it to find your way when you're lost without a compass, though if you don't know how to find it, then you're, you might have trouble uh, because most of the really bright stars show up in the south, and if you pick one of those to follow, then you're going the exact wrong direction. Uh, but the best way to find it is to use the Big Dipper, which you can see right here. It's got seven stars, and almost all of these are brighter than Polaris. So the Big Dipper is way easier to find than the North Star. Uh, so you got one, uh, let's see, yeah, it's gonna light up the whole thing. So the Big Dipper is part of the constellation Ursa Major, which is the Great Bear. And if we turn on our uh, shapes here, we can see we got the Big Bear and the Little Bear. The Big Dipper is just part, the kind of back and tail of the bear. These are funny looking bears. They have much longer tails than normal bears do. Um, but if you can find the handle of the Big Dipper and the cup, these two stars here at the front of the cup, if you trace a line across the sky, then you hit Polaris. And that's the, the best and easiest way to find the North Star, which is a very, very useful thing to do if you're lost. Great, thank you. You're pointing out a bunch of um, stars and you were talking about planets earlier that something that's gonna be happening in the next few days here. Josephine and Hannah both wanna know how you can tell the difference between a star and a planet when you're looking at the sky. Very, very good question. And if, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, then it's really hard to tell. Uh, in general, planets are much brighter than most of the stars. Uh, I think, yeah, Jupiter, Jupiter and Mars, at least, are outshine any other star in the sky, including Sirius. I think Sirius might be a tiny bit brighter than Saturn, uh, but it's close. Um, and then there's the, the whole thing where stars twinkle in the sky, uh, which is caused by kind of bubbles of different temperature air moving through the atmosphere. Uh, as the light passes through them, the light kind of gets deflected a little bit. Uh, and it causes the stars for, you know, from our perspective to twinkle. Uh, and a lot of people will tell you that you know, planets don't twinkle because they're too bright and they're closer, so they're bigger. Um, in, in my experience, that hasn't really panned out, uh, you know, because I've, you know, I've seen planets kind of twinkle a little bit, uh, so I wouldn't necessarily go by that. Um, they're, they're brighter than stars. Um, and really the, the best way to, uh, to identify them is to you know, use one of those apps. You go out and say, what is that bright object? And if it's really bright, it's probably a planet. Uh, and you know, the, those apps will, will tell you that. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's a question about, um, Josh was talking about uh, Ceres and Airy being dwarf planets, um, and if we know if there are other dwarf planets um, out there. Yes, absolutely. There's a whole bunch of dwarf planets. Uh, you mentioned Ceres, which is was the first dwarf planet discovered. Uh, it lives in the asteroid belt. Uh, of course, Pluto is the probably most famous dwarf planet. Uh, and then Eris is uh, another one, and there's uh, a handful of other named ones too. There's uh, Makemake, uh, Haumea, 
and we're finding more of them all the time, uh, which is you know one of the reasons that Pluto was changed from being a full planet into a dwarf planet. We kept finding all of these other things that were like Pluto. They were you know, the same size. Eris is just a tiny, tiny bit smaller than Pluto, but it's actually heavier than Pluto is. So we had to make a decision, you know, is this going to be, are we going to make all of these things planets and have, you know, 30 planets in the solar system? Or do we reclassify Pluto and then have eight planets and a bunch of dwarf planets? Uh, <laughs> Lots of people are very upset by this because everybody loves Pluto, and how could you not love Pluto? Uh, but I like to think of it as a promotion. Pluto went from being the tiniest and wimpiest dwarf, or tiniest and wimpiest planet, to being the king of the dwarf planet. So I think it's a, a promotion. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so bringing the question back to um, how you got a job doing what you do. Um, Fabian and Miranda kind of have similar questions. Fabian wanted to know what pros and cons there are of the job that you have, while Miranda, who loves the Apollo program, wants suggestions on how she can get into this field of work. Yeah, so uh, pros and cons of my job, you know, the pros are being able to you know, do stuff like this. Uh, you know, I'm sure that everybody you know, watching has you know, a, a game or a TV show or a sport or some kind of activity that you just love. And if someone will let you talk about it, you can just talk and talk and talk about it for hours and hours and hours. If you, like, you really like Minecraft, then you can go on for hours talking about how cool Minecraft is. My thing is space. And my whole job is just telling people how cool space is. Uh, and it's just the best thing. Uh, the the cons are all of the you know, the paperwork and the scheduling and the managing that I have to do, but uh, doing the actual planetarium stuff more than makes up for it. Uh, and then what, the other question was uh, how to get into uh, something like this. Uh, if you want to you know end up working for uh, NASA or really any you know any astronomy uh, aerospace engineering, which is another uh, thing that my my master's degree is actually in aerospace. Uh, engineering and you to get started you really need to take a lot of math and a lot of physics um, and then once you get into into college you can kind of decide whether you want to go the engineering route or if you want to go into the you know, the pure science you know astrophysics uh, type thing and both of those are really really exciting fields where lots of cool new stuff is happening all the time but the fundamentals start with math and physics All right. Uh, so I think we're coming in on time, aren't we? Yeah. So thank you for walking us through some of this. Yuri, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thanks, Mrs. Brown. Scott, thank you so much for taking us through this journey, um, learning about the stars, the planets. Um, can you do me a favor? Can you remind us of that event that's happening on Monday again so people can make sure if they have an opportunity to go outside and also the time that maybe it's the best to, to see this uh, event? Yeah, so it's the, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn where they'll be so close together that you won't be able to tell where one stops and the next one starts. Uh, and that'll be Monday night uh, around six o'clock is probably the best time to see it. Uh, because as we saw, it sets by seven. Uh, so if you don't see it between sunset and seven o'clock, then you kind of missed it. Of course, you can see it again the next night. They just won't be quite as close together. Uh, but they're not going to you know, disappear or anything uh, like that. And you know, the best way to make sure you see it is to go out and like practice tonight. Try and spot them low in the southwest just after sunset tonight, and then you know exactly where they're going to be. Awesome, thank you. I know that I'll be looking that for that for sure. Um, and then you mentioned something in February that's happening with the rover. Yes, so the the Mars rover. I I have to double check my date. It's sometime in the middle of February. Uh, that the Mars Perseverance rover is going to touch down on the surface. Uh, it'll be a very, very exciting landing. They're using the same uh, hover crane uh, deploying uh, stuff that they did with the Curiosity rover back in 2012, where the, the rocket crane comes down and it fires these rockets and hovers there and it, lo it lowers the rover on cables. And then as soon as the rover touches the ground, it breaks the cables off and flies away. Uh, and the rover actually comes equipped with a tiny 
helicopter, the first ever you know aircraft that will fly on Mars. Is this tiny, tiny little helicopter that's going to fly around and get drone photos, uh, which will be really, really, really cool if it works. Of course, there is always a chance that something terrible will happen, and you know the rockets don't fire and it just crashes into the ground. We've seen that happen with uh, at least two uh, you know Mars missions in the past. Um, but you know, every time you know these engineers fail at something, it's a, an opportunity to learn and to redesign and make it better uh, until we're just nailing these every single time. Uh, and so I have the utmost confidence in, uh, in NASA and JPL's teams that they can easily land this thing and have another very, very successful mission, just like uh, Curiosity has been giving us for the last eight years. That's great. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for sharing that information. And, you know, again, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. If they were able to visit the planetarium, thinking ahead, uh, when we're able to do so, how can they actually visit where you work? Yeah, so one, the, of course, the, the planetarium is closed right now uh, due to the pandemic. But as soon as we open, which hopefully, fingers crossed, no promises, uh, will be uh, sometime this summer. Uh, and once we're open, we'll start doing you know, field trips again. So if your teachers want to uh, come and uh, visit the planetarium, we do field trips during the week. And if you want to just come with your, your family, your friends, your parents, uh, we have public shows on the weekends and Friday nights where you can come and, uh, and buy tickets and just see a, uh, a star show. That's perfect. Um, and I know that a lot of people might know of the Griffith Observatory. That's a little bit of a drive. So the fact that we have something in Orange County where you can go to a planetarium and learn all these really neat, interesting facts about the stars and the universe, I think it's fantastic. So again, Scott, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for uh, sharing all your knowledge. Uh, Mrs. Brown, thank you for taking a look at the chat and then jumping in with those questions. And for everybody that's here, you know, once again, thank you for joining our second episode of the Backyard Mission series. Again, these were created for you to get outside with your family and make those observations. The first was on birds. Now we're talking about stars. We're going to come back at the end of January with a froze there for a sec. There wasn't a question to me, was it? <laughs> no, 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 sorry. So there was a little bit of a technical difficulty there, but I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and we'll see you again at the end of January with our next uh, episode of Backyard Missions. Thank you, Scott. Thanks everybody.